Why do we not commit? And we all get it, don't we? Because we've all been on the giving end of a wishy-washy commitment. We've all been on the receiving end of a wishy-washy commitment at the same time, trying to get somebody else to commit and rally about something that you want to do. Commitment. You know, there is, I believe, an ultimate commitment that we need to make in life. And if we don't do it, then we can continue to juggle all of the commitments and there's various importances of commitments that come at us and we can continuously juggle those trying to make as many people we know as happy as possible. Now, if that's the life you want, go for it. But I think if we have a solid rock, Jesus Christ, right? I, I peeked at the end of my sermon, I know the answer. If we have a solid rock, then I think that's gonna help us organize the rest of the commitments that come after uh, that come toward us. Our passage this morning is Matthew chapter five as we continue in the Sermon on the Mount. What about marriage, divorce, and commitment, which is about all that I wanna share with you. Matthew chapter five, verses 31 through 37. Let's stand at the reading of God's word this morning. Matthew chapter five, verses 31 through 37. Jesus says this, he says, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. You may be seated. So let's quick, quickly look. I've got four points I wanna share with you and then a conclusion. So let's look at those four points. They're also in the bulletin. So we begin with whatever happened to commitment. And then from there, we're gonna start some exegesis with what's commitment in marriage. And that's gonna be verses 31 and 32. And then the next point is going to be what's commitment in relationships, all right? That's verses 33 through 37, that's the oaths. Then we're gonna come back and look overall again at what is discipleship. And then the conclusion, is we have to keep the end in sight. What do you want to have at the end of your life? So let's back all the way back up. Whatever happened to commitment? Whatever happened to doing a good job? What happened to trying your best? What happened to customer service? What happened to caring about the other person? What about doing hard things? What happened to multiple decades marriages? What happened to keeping your word? Now, don't think that we have a lack of commitment and we've got a corner on the market throughout all of history on a lack of commitment. Because when we think back all the way to the very beginning, wasn't there a lack of commitment there? Because God, didn't God say something to the effect of, I want you to commit to me that you are not going to eat from that tree right there. I mean, he didn't say those words, but obedience is about commitment. And if you're not committed to something, you're not going to be obedient in that, are you? So Jesus is now coming here to us with commitment. I need you committed. And the reason why I know that you're not committed is because your morality isn't where it's supposed to be. We talked about that last week with lust and adultery. We talked about it the week before with anger and hatred and murder. We see it here, divorce and marriage and the harm that's going on in many marriages. Jesus says there two are linked together. Addressing commitment because it's evidenced in a lack of morals. How about that? A lack of commitment affects the way I live out my life ethically. Wow, commitment's important. And that means the lack of it is significant. So why does it seem that a lack of commitment is tied to morals? I think N.T. Wright is onto something because he has noted that many who view tolerance and open-mindedness, and aren't we in a time period of tolerance and open-mindedness? We need to tolerate all of the different beliefs. We need to be open-minded about many other beliefs that are all around us. That those who are into these as virtues, 
they also think about somebody who has a belief in something specific or that they are committed to something is almost the equivalent of an intellectual vice, an intellectual sin. Oh my goodness, they're committed to something? Oh my, they have one belief and think that's the only right way? Oh, heaven forbid. Virtue today is not having a strong opinion. That's what our society is telling us. Virtue today is found in not making up your mind about something. G.K. Chesterton, a century ago, a writer, he said this. He said that when people decide to quit believing in God, it's not that they start believing in nothing, but that they start believing in anything. Once you take away belief in God, it doesn't leave a vacuum. It means that anything can now fill in the place of God, and that is what people do. They fill all sorts of ideas into their minds, and they begin to slosh around and move around. Let's try this belief for a while. Oh, I like it. I did that for a while. Now I'm going to move on to something else. And someone will say, have you tried this? Oh, yeah, I tried that for a few months last year. I didn't like it. I moved on to something else, all right? And how do we see what's going on as a result of all of these ideas sloshing around in our society's minds? Don't we see increase in morality and an increase in crime? Isn't that what I'm reading in the news? Are you reading something else? Is crime all of a sudden taken a vacation and stopped or is crime going up? Do we see more immorality? And do we see things that we thought we would never see in our lives or are we seeing a whole bunch of that? I think N.T. Wright was onto something there. Folks, shallow thinking like that and failure to commit to something results in the morality of our community, our society going right out the window. There comes a point that we have to stake our lives to something, that you have to go with it, you have to believe something. And if you don't, then there's going to be a price to pay. Folks, life, what about a risk? What if I'm, what if I'm wrong? Pastor, what if you're wrong about something? I've thought about that. I've thought about if I die and I go see a guy sitting down, no shirt on, real tubby, got a clock planted firmly in his belly button, goes by the name Buddha, I'm going to think I'm in trouble, all right? I'm in trouble because I didn't go after this guy's teaching. I, I, I don't follow Buddhism. I'm staking my life to Jesus Christ, all right? I'm not staking my life to Jesus this week, Buddha next week, Hinduism the next week, Islam the next week, something else the week after, whatever you want to fill in the blank. I'm going to stake my life to Jesus Christ, and I want to follow after him, and I want to live life committed to him. I think that's the way that I should live. If not, then we're going to have wishy-washy lives, wishy-washy beliefs, and if we don't risk, life is risky, isn't it, folks? It's risky. You just drive through an intersection in Corpus Christi, Texas. Life is risky, all right? If life is risky, if you don't want to risk about a belief, then you know what? You are not going to have life that's very deep or very full. And that's not the way God has created us to live this life. So now, what's happened to commitment? We know we need it. So Jesus talks about in verses 31 and 32, he talks about marriage and divorce. So let's go there. What about commitment? What's commitment in marriage? Now, what is, I mean, those are hard words, right? You divorce your wife, if you divorce your wife, except for sexual immorality, you make her the victim of adultery. Anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. That means if I'm divorced, that's, that's, I'm messed up. And if I remarry, I'm just going to be in a constant state of adultery. I mean, what's going on? If we, if we take it that way, then we're going to have some issues with our interpretations. That's why a lot of people, you know what I think most Christians have done? And even conservative evangelical Baptists like us. You know what? I think Jesus was talking to a unique problem in the first century. Divorce was too frequent. And he addressed that problem. And today we have gone through the enlightenment, right? Back, what, five, six hundred years ago. We've gone through the enlightenment. We know Oh, so much more now, and that divorce isn't a problem anymore. Or should I say, 
we don't have a problem with divorce anymore, right? Haven't we just seemingly tried to baptize it into the church? Or if nothing else, we simply ignore the teaching of what Jesus said. Let's move on to the next section about oaths, all right? But only quickly there because, you know, your marriage ceremony was about an oath, wasn't it? I don't think that's the way that we need to do it. We could examine each word, classify every word, and then we can put in place an extreme ethic, just like I was mentioning just a moment ago. And that if you get divorced, oh my gosh, I mean, isn't that one of the unforgivable sins, right? I mean, that's, isn't that the way Baptist churches have treated divorced people for a long time? You know, it's, it's the unforgivable sin that Jesus forgot to mention, right? And then if you ever get remarried, oh my goodness, the gossips, I'm sorry, we're Baptist. The speaking of people that's going to go take place all around everywhere. Oh, my goodness. And yeah, you know how they are, right? Well, the problem with that, though, folks, is that Jesus is referencing to De Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. And in that passage right there, Jesus, God told Moses how the people were to do divorce. All right? He didn't say, I don't want you to do divorce, but since you're going to do it anyway, and it's a sin, by the way, then here's how to do it. Does God ever have to tell us how to sin, right? Really? Here's how I want you to sin, okay? This is a, so here's my view, folks. Divorce isn't the sin, all right? And nowhere in Scripture does, does it say that divorce is equivalent to a sin. It's not there. All right. Yes, I know the passages. You got Malachi involved. Don't forget about Ezra. We got issues going on with the book of Ezra about putting wives away. Jesus has more teaching in chapter 19. We have the other gospel accounts. Paul has a lot to say in chapter 6 and 7 of 1 Corinthians. But folks, let's step back a minute. Let's don't look at all of the individual words and try to parse everything that way. Let's step back. What's Jesus trying to say here? He's trying to say, you're divorcing too quickly, divorce is too easy. What do we say to today? What do you think Jesus would tell our society today? You're divorcing too quickly, divorce is too easy. This isn't what marriage is supposed to be about. Marriage shouldn't begin with something called a starter marriage. But yes, there it's even labeled now. Some of you may not have heard that. But yes, so that was my starter marriage. And then I had my first real marriage. And now I'm working on my second real marriage, which isn't going so well. So I'm hoping that maybe by the time I divorce in my next marriage, I'll have it straightened out in my life, you know. I, that's a bit extreme, I understand. But it can get to that point, folks. The issue that Jesus says in Matthew 19, why did Moses give you this law? Why did he tell you how you needed to do divorce? It's not because of the divorce. The problem is your heart. You are hard hearted. Your hearts were hard is what he says in chapter 19 of Matthew. And folks, when one party or both parties in a marriage have a hard heart, you're going to have a hard marriage, all right? It's going to be a tough marriage to get through. And that's just a fact. Divorce. What does divorce do? Listen to the words of Dallas Willard in his book, The Divine Conspiracy. He says this. He says, quote, divorce disrupts a natural unit in a way that harms its members for life. No matter how much worse, emphasis on that word, it would have been for them to stay together, end quote. That means that one or both parties have stopped putting Jesus first in their lives. That's what divorce means. And so that's why we say what? Christians marry Christians, right? Because if you marry somebody outside of the faith, how is that person dedicated to Jesus Christ? They're not. They're not. So that's what we encourage. Yes, I heard years ago, years ago, you need write down 10 things you want in a prospective spouse, 10 things. If you get one of them, you're doing great, okay, all right? I, I snuck in two, all right? I snuck in, she has to be a Christian, right? Okay, I know that you're thinking, what's the other one, Pastor? What's the other? She has to be drop-dead gorgeous too, all right? Yeah, <laughs> isn't that real? Yeah, that's right, honey, that's what I did. So Christian was a given for me. A believer was a given. 
By the way, if you're in a marriage that you're saved and your spouse isn't, that's not a reason to bail out on the marriage, by the way, all right? What we need, folks, is commitment, isn't it? That's what we need. Marriage is a covenant. It's a union between a male and a female. It's not about just being roommates. That's not good enough. It's not just about sex. That's not good enough itself. It's not even trying to tell us about, I don't think Jesus is trying to stress too much about what adultery and sex outside of marriage is. He did that. He did it last week in the verses right before this one. Lust is adultery. He did it also. Hatred is murder. So our minds have to be in the right place. And what Jesus, I think, is doing is he's trying to put a protection for women, all right? If you force her to commit adultery, except for adultery, right? What's a woman who's been divorced in Jesus' time and in Palestine at this time period? What's a woman going to do who's been divorced, been written that certificate of divorce? She can go back to family. If there is family, she may not have family. Family who will accept her. They don't have to take her back. Or she can become what? What? Could she go to Walmart? No, we don't have Walmart back then. I know Walmart is everywhere, but they didn't have it in Jerusalem in Jesus' day, okay? She can't get a job at Walmart. So she has to get a job being a prostitute. That's what she has to do. Or she has to find a husband, all right? And it doesn't matter. You just got to find a husband. Adultery. God sees the first marriage as the one that should continue to go on. And don't be silly. Don't be silly to think that if somebody has divorced, a man has divorced a first wife, married a second wife, oh, you're living in adultery, you got to go back to wife number one, all right? That's silly exegesis, number one, all right? That's not the way to interpret the Bible. And number two, Deuteronomy specifically forbids that happening, okay? Deuteronomy says you can, you're not supposed to go back to wife number one. In marriage, two become one. And this is what the commitment is about, folks. It gives us, a, a marriage is about living out our Christian faith with someone who is special, who is close to us. And we live for holiness, to live holy lives to God. To be able to say, you know what, look at us. We are trying to live in fellowship with one another. It's not just me and trying to live for Christ. I'm in a relationship with somebody and I wanna dedicate myself to God in this marriage. It doesn't mean that you have to stay in a bad relationship, in a dangerous relationship. So hear me on this. It's usually women, but it can be men. But ladies, if you're married and you are afraid for your physical health, your physical well-being, your psychological well-being, even your social well-being, I'm going to tell you, you need to leave. Get, protect, get it to a place of protection. I'll never say divorce. That's going to be between you and the Lord, and I'll counsel you through all of that. But I need you to get to a place of protection. And I will never tell you that if you feel threatened to go back to that husband, all right, that's not right either. You're made in the image of God. And I think it's important for the church to protect everybody who's made in the image of God. So let's get that straight right away. Divorce. Divorce is bad. Dallas Willard, did you hear his quote? Did you catch the end of it? Divorce is devastating on people upon even beyond just the couple. But sometimes, you know what, it's worse to stay married. It doesn't make the divorce good, but sometimes it is worse to stay married. Marriage. If it sounds like it's a lot of work, it's because it is a lot of work. Most of us husbands can say, ask our wives, right? They have to work with us a whole lot to put up with what we do and don't do. Marriage is a lot of work. It was harder for the ancients because they didn't necessarily have a big say in who they married. So this morning, marry carefully. Don't get in a rush. And what we're finding is that people, good thing, people are, are waiting longer to get married. The bad thing is, is that they're living together with several different people. Until they get married, that's not what's supposed to happen. Marriage, it's work. And it's work because love is work. To truly love somebody takes a lot of work. Singleness, now let me touch on singleness real quick here. I don't want you singles to be left out or something. 
So much of scripture talks about marriage and divorce because it is so predominant in ancient society, even in our society today. But singleness, Paul addresses singleness, says that you can dedicate yourself more fully to the Lord. Don't have to worry about a spouse. What do you give up in singleness, all right? Tim Keller says that, you know, what you give up isn't the sex. That's not what you're giving up. What you're giving up is heirs. What you're giving up is the ability to have more family. And instead of trusting the church family, you're trusting in the kingdom of God. Instead of trusting even in a biological family, it's the kingdom of God. And hopefully the church family can be that part of that kingdom that you rely upon. And so that's where singles come into place. In the ancient world, singleness was rejected. For early Christians, they found a place, singles found a place where they were accepted. And it should be the same in our church today. So what's commitment in marriage look like? We're dedicated to God because we're Christians and we're gonna show it in our marriages. Now our next several verses, verses 33 through 37, what's commitment in relationships? What's that about? If we're not committed in our marriages, then we're not gonna be committed, I think, in other areas of our life. It's not that the most important relationship, humanly speaking, you're going to have is out the window and all the others all of a sudden so important. No, it doesn't work that way. Get the big one first and then move on from there. Jesus answered this issue about the oaths that are going on. And what happened in the ancient times there in, in Jesus' day, people would swear, I'm gonna deal, I'm gonna deal with you here. I will promise I am going, let me, let me have your car, and I promise I'm gonna pay you $200,000 for your old broken down Chevy, all right, or Ford, or whatever car company you don't like, all right? I'm gonna give you half a million dollars for it, all right, but give me the keys now. And so, of course, you give me the keys now. And I swear by heaven and earth, I'm going to do it. Come Tuesday, you come looking for your money, and it's like, you know what? You don't know the code, right? If I swear by heaven and earth, I don't have to keep it. If I would have sworn by Jerusalem, oh, then I would have had to keep it. And that's what was going on in that time period. Jesus even addresses that about swearing by heaven or about Jerusalem. There's even a tractate in the Mishnah that teaches about what is binding and what is not binding. That if I swear by the altar, I'm not bound. But if I swear by the sacrifice on the altar, oh, I'm bound to do it now. Jesus says, forget all of that nonsense. Just do what you say you're going to do and move on from there. And that's called commitment, folks, to be able to keep your word. What about our tolerant friends? Those who tolerate everything. Any belief is okay. We're open to any belief. You Christians are so intolerant. You know what? There are some sinfully intolerant Christians, and there are a whole bunch of them who happen to be Baptists, all right? But I'm going to tell you a little bit about how intolerant we are here at Second Baptist Church, all right? Guests here, get your pen out. Let me show you how we're intolerant, okay? The way that we are intolerant follows this way. We're intolerant to the point, better than those who are tolerant, we are intolerant about poverty to the point that we want to make a difference in people's lives who are living in poverty. Those who are tolerant, well, good luck with that poverty thing that's going on because we're not doing anything to help you. As Christians here at this church, we're intolerant about pornography and about prostitution because we see the human trafficking and the trauma that that causes. And what do other people say who are open to everything? Well, that's just their individual choices that they're making. What about being intolerant toward gambling? We're intolerant toward gambling because we see the devastating effects it causes on individuals, on families, on society, and upon all other people around gambling. And all of those people who say that they're tolerant, you know what, let each person, they should be able to make their own choice. Really? Really? In the face of all of this devastation, folks, this two weeks of Super Bowl, this weekend, today at the Super Bowl, there are people who are literally gambling away their family's paycheck. And they're going to lose it. And their family's going to hurt. Oh, that's their choice. I don't think the family had a choice about that but you don't care because you're tolerant, right? Well, you know what? I do care. 
And I've seen the devastation in people's lives who are addicted to gambling and it is painful. I'm intolerant about that. I'm intolerant about human trafficking, which pornography, that's human trafficking. The pictures there are not of people who are willing. The prostitution that's going on in Phoenix right now, that's human trafficking, okay? That's what's going on right there. And these ladies, mostly ladies who are being traumatized, you don't care about that? You think that should be tolerated? Well, they're doing all the work of toleration while you're being so tolerant. I say no, that we wanna step in and we want justice done. And we think more highly of the way this society should be run. What's discipleship, our fourth point? Discipleship, folks, is commitment. Discipleship, if you're gonna follow after Jesus Christ, you're not saying, you know what? I think I'll follow Jesus for a while. No, that's not it. You don't come forward here and say, you know what, pastor? I wanna receive Jesus as my savior and I want him to be my savior most of the time. But then I do have some days I need on my own. No, don't come. And I can say that because you know what Jesus did whenever the crowd started getting really big? He started telling them, count the cost because there's a cost. It's free to accept salvation, but Jesus wants all of your life. And when he comes calling and saying, I need this area of your life, you need to say, oh yes, I agree to give that area of my life up to you. And so you need to give it up. Discipleship, it's commitment. It's commitment when it's hard. When it's easy to follow Jesus, even non-Christians follow Jesus, okay? It's easy. But when it's hard, that's when commitment has to kick in. And that's when we have to give. Let's look at it this way, folks, in our commitment. How well do your electronic devices work? I'll take yours. Kathy and I have been fighting about Wi-Fi, not each other. We've been trying to get Wi-Fi at our house. And you know what you do? You know what the last resort of trying to get better Wi-Fi after you, this is after you wrap foil around your house three times, right? Okay, that's what we do. Yeah. You finally call the company because it is punitive to call any of the providers, right? And so they say, you know what? Oh, you lost internet 41 times today. Yes, I know, you lost it for 35 seconds and a minute two here, and it's like, you don't have to tell me, I lived it, okay, yeah, we've lost it. And then they send you equipment, and guess what? We don't have Wi-Fi, we lose it. 39 seconds here, a minute two over here, all right, we lose it, call them back, we'll send out a worker. He comes in, this box they sent you brand new, yeah, he goes, it's not working. It's like, I know, I know it's not working, that's why, why didn't I call you, yeah. So it's supposed to be better now and it's wonderful for Kathy, but I'm still having glitches in some of my stuff. Folks, do you want your electronic devices to be as committed to working for you as you are in your life, in your commitments? Ouch, no. My devices that hardly ever work. What about your commitment to Jesus Christ? How well, if it mirrors on your devices, how well... Will that go? Yeah. I know it's irrational, but I really want my devices to work all the time. And it's irrational. I got it. I got it. It's going to not work at times. But I have hopes. What do I want? This is our conclusion. Keeping the end in sight. Here's what I want. I want to be a man of my word. And I know that I'll fail. Blame me. And when I am a man of my word, don't give me credit, give God credit because I would be a much bigger failure without him. I wanna be married to my wife for a long, faithful time. I want my boys to say that I was a good dad. I wanna be known as a follower of Jesus Christ, as his ambassador, as one who represented him well in this community and around anyone and everyone that I met. That's what I want to be known as. What end do you want for yourself? The commitment that you need to make today begins with the commitment of Jesus Christ. Because if you're trying to be committed without having your commitment to Jesus Christ, your commitment is built on a house of cards and it will fall apart at some point. You need a stronger foundation than that. 
this morning, I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ came and lived a perfect life. He died on the cross, innocent of the charges, but he willingly went to the cross to die so that our sin would go to him on the cross. One who knew no sin became sin so that you and I might be and could be the righteousness of God. Jesus was buried and rose again. And in that process, our salvation is available, but you must call upon the name of the Lord. That's what Paul says in Romans 10, 13. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Will you commit to Jesus today and find a life that's worth the risk because it is so full? Come forward and receive Christ this day. Come forward and join our church. Come forward for special prayer. The staff will be up here. You'll be able to call online or reach out through our websites as well, the various uh, platforms we have with Facebook and the website. What's your decision this day? Let's stand for a word of prayer right now. Lord, commitment can be very tricky for us because we want to keep our word we're hesitant to commit to something because something else may come up. Lord, help us to understand when we're committed to you, we follow after you. And that when we're committed to you, other commitments fall into place and we'll be able to tell people at appropriate times. But Lord, that commitment to you must be primary, must be foundational because it's all important. And there are those here this day that are hearing this message right now that need to commit their lives to you, to receive your salvation, that though you paid it all and there's no cost for us to receive your salvation, you want our lives. May we be obedient to give that to you as we submit to your Lordship to follow you for salvation forever. Lord, make that so in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.